Hello everyone, on behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to our webinar, Wastewater Treatment of Septic and Basic Lagoons. My name is Kristen Crew from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. Before we begin, we're going to go over a few logistics and then we can get started. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. We will be saving your questions for a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that includes a link to the recording and other information that you may need. You can also download the slides from today in the Handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. This webinar has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but eligible attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for their personal record. To receive a certificate for this session, you must attend for the entire session and register and attend individually using your real name and unique email address. Certificates will be sent via email within 30 days of the webinar date. If you have questions or need assistance, please contact smallsystems at syr.edu. Now for a little bit about us. The Environmental Finance Center Network provides training and technical assistance to small water and wastewater systems in all U.S. states and territories throughout or through our building technical, managerial, and finance capacities programs. If your community or utility needs assistance with drinking water or wastewater system management, please feel free to contact us through a request form, which I will be sharing shortly in the chat. And on that note, we can get started. I would like to introduce our presenter for today, KT Newman. He is the owner of the Utility Contractors LLC. Welcome KT, and I am going to pass it right over to you. Thank you, Christy. <clears throat> Welcome to all of you attending today's presentation. My name is KT Newman, and I will be your presenter. I am the owner of Utility Contractors, and we provide a number of technical and managerial services to small water and wastewater systems across the state of Mississippi. I've had the pleasure of providing training on a wide array of topics for over 26 years, and I look forward to today's session on on-site wastewater treatment and basic lagoons. Whether you are a mayor, councilman, tribal council member, operator, or anyone who may be taxed from time to time with making water quality decisions, we believe the information being presented today will be beneficial. As you know, there are many types of wastewater treatment available today, ranging drastically in cost and complexity. Today, however, we will focus on two basic types of on-site wastewater treatment, the conventional septic tank and the aerobic septic tank, also referred to as an aerobic treatment unit. We will also briefly discuss two centralized wastewater treatment options, facultative and aerated lagoons. So what is wastewater? Wastewater can be defined as water that has constituents of human and or metabolic waste. Wastewater comes from ordinary living processes, bathing, toilet flushing, cooking, laundry, etc. After we use water for these various purposes, where does it go? The answer is back to the environment, and it becomes an important component of the hydrologic cycle. 
if improperly treated, contaminated water can be released back into the environment and become a significant source of pollution. I'm sure we are all familiar with the hydrologic cycle. However, we often take for granted how our actions may impact the water cycle, particularly as it relates to wastewater treatment. We previously defined wastewater as being water that has constituents of human and or animal metabolic waste. Wastewater can be further categorized as domestic or industrial. For the purpose of this discussion, we will focus entirely on domestic wastewater. By weight, wastewater is overwhelmingly comprised of water over 99%. It is the small portion of other constituents, however, that must be removed or drastically reduced in order to protect the environment. These constituents primarily consist of the following. Organic matter. Organic matter plays a large role in the environment. The amount of organic matter in wastewater discharged to a stream determines how much oxygen is available for fish to breathe. The organic matter content of soil particles affect nutrient retention, water holding capacity, and the soil's ability to provide nutrients for plant growth. In wastewater treatment, Organic matter is measured as oxygen demand, BOD. BOD is a measure of the biodegradability of the organic matter expressed in terms of oxygen equivalence. The greater the BOD, the more rapidly oxygen is depleted in the stream. This means less oxygen is available for aquatic life. The consequences of high BOD are the same as those for low dissolved oxygen. Aquatic organisms become stressed and die. Among the other microorganisms that we must remove are pathogenic bacteria. Pathogenic meaning disease causing typically found in sewage. For example, E. coli. We're all familiar with E. coli. Why do we measure E. coli? Water samples are collected to measure E. coli to make sure water is safe for public recreation, such as swimming, fishing, or canoeing. E. coli is considered an indicator organism used to identify fecal contamination in fresh water and indicate the possible presence of disease-causing bacteria and viruses. Individuals who swim or come in contact with water with elevated levels of E. coli and other fecal indicated organisms are at an increased risk of getting sick because of potential exposure to fecal pathogens. Common symptoms of ingesting a pathogenic strain of E. coli include vomiting and diarrhea. High numbers of E. coli bacteria may contribute to cloudy water, unpleasant odors, and increased oxygen demand, which may reduce levels of dissolved oxygen in the water. E. coli concentration may be linked with other parameters such as high total suspended solids and turbidity concentrations because the bacteria tend to be found with particles. E. coli concentrations may also be linked with high phosphorus, nitrate, 
and biological oxygen demand concentrations. E. coli from humans can reach surface water via wastewater treatment plant effluent, broken or leaky sewer pipes, and failing or poorly sited septic systems. There are a number of inorganic compounds to be removed from wastewater as well. Phosphorus and nitrates are the inorganic compounds of greatest concern. In excessive amounts, they cause dramatic increases in aquatic plant growth and changes in the types of plants and animals that live in the receiving streams. The primary goal in wastewater treatment is to remove waste out of the water. This is often a difficult task, but we have lots of help available to us, such as gravity. Gravity-fed systems don't use any sort of groundbreaking technology. They simply use natural forces to guide the wastewater where it needs to go. This is a particularly useful component of wastewater treatment in septic and anaerobic treatment systems. The sun. The sun plays a crucial role in wastewater treatment, particularly in lagoons. Sunlight contributes to the growth of algae on the water surface. Algae benefits wastewater treatment by producing oxygen that allows certain bacteria to break down organic matter. Microorganisms. We mentioned microorganisms just a second ago in reference to disease causing pathogens but not all microorganisms are disease causing. Some are in fact essential in wastewater treatment. Two such types of microorganisms are anaerobic bacteria, which means they grow in the absence of oxygen, and anaerobic bacteria, which survives and grows in an oxygenated environment. And finally, we've got the soil. The soil treats wastewater by filtering out particles, removing some chemicals and nutrients, and acting as a site for destroying pathogens. Soil particles provide surface area for wastewater to pass over to be treated. So what are some of the ways wastewater is treated? On-site wastewater treatment is a practice that involves collecting, treating, and disposing of or reusing wastewater from individual or clustered sources at or near where it is generated. Population density, the topography of the area, soil conditions, and numerous other factors are involved in the construction and operation of a sewage collection system. Increasing migration to suburban and rural areas make municipal sewers more difficult and costly to build and maintain. On-site treatment systems are often the most practical and cost-effective solution for wastewater treatment and disposal. Statistics show that more than one in five households in the United States depend on individual septic systems to treat their wastewater. When you hear the term septic system, decentralized wastewater system, or aerobic treatment unit, they all refer to some type of on-site wastewater treatment that uses a combination of natural and technological processes to treat wastewater from household plumbing. 
as previously mentioned, there are various types of on-site wastewater treatment system. If a system is properly installed, sited, and maintained, it can protect public health, preserve valuable water resources, and maintain economic vitality in a community. Let's examine some of the types and discuss ways to properly maintain them. A conventional septic system. A conventional septic system is a type of on-site sewage treatment and disposal system that is common for residential properties. It has a septic tank, which is a watertight container buried in the ground, and a drain field or leach field, which is a series of perforated pipes or chambers that release the wastewater into the soil. The septic tank separates the wastewater into three layers, solids, liquids, and floatable matter. The liquid layer or effluent flows out of the tank and into the drain field where it is further treated by the soil and microbes. Conventional septic systems may have different designs and materials, but they all function similarly. However, they all may also pose environmental risk such as nitrogen and pathogen pollution, especially if they are older or poorly maintained. <clears throat> How does a conventional septic system work? Solid and liquid waste enters through the same septic tank, with solid waste settling at the bottom and liquid waste staying at the top. Anaerobic microbes break down the waste and produce wastewater. Conventional septic systems only work, however, when three factors are present. Number one, is permeable soil. The ability of soil to accept water or for water to travel through soil is called soil permeability. Percolation is the movement of water through the soil. A soil percolation test is designed to measure the rate of water movement in saturated soil, mimicking conditions that soil treatment systems have so that one can decide the appropriate type and size of a treatment system. Unsaturated water table and no restrictive bedrock, both are necessary to ensure water is able to soak into the ground and not rise to the surface, creating an odor. There you have some basic diagrams of uh, conventional septic systems. Uh, the, the number of compartments in a septic tank uh, could vary. The diagram, of course, could vary, but in a general sense, this is what you could expect from a conventional septic tank. And the, the conventional septic tank uh, does offer uh, a few benefits, quite a few benefits, in fact, such as uh, low low maintenance, uh, low cost of operation, and compared to the aerobic treatment unit, there's no electricity. So the operational costs for a septic tank are going to be way less than for an aerobic treatment unit. There are, of course, some disadvantages. The effluent from the septic tank is of lower quality than from the aerobic unit. Also, the septic tank is limited in where it can be installed based upon the types of soil that may be present. We just talked about the percolation test uh, and all that, that plays a huge factor in determining whether or not a septic tank may be suitable for a particular location. 
aerobic treatment systems. An aerobic treatment system uses many of the same processes as a municipal sewage plant, but on a much smaller scale. An aerobic system injects oxygen into the treatment tank. The additional oxygen increases natural bacterial activity within the system that then provides additional treatment for nutrients in the effluent. Some aerobic systems may also have a pretreatment tank and a final treatment tank, including disinfection to further reduce pathogen levels. The benefits of this system are that it can be used in homes with smaller lots, inadequate soil conditions, in areas where the water table is too high, or for homes close to a surface water body sensitive to, sensitive to contamination by nutrients contained in wastewater effluent. And here is a, a, a very basic picture of an aerobic treatment unit paying particular attention to the air pump. Of course, uh, there are many varied versions and designs for an aerobic treatment unit, but all of which will uh, employ some type of uh, aeration. How does an aerobic septic system work? Like a conventional system, solids and liquid waste enters the tank and settles into layers in an aerobic septic system. However, they are more complex than conventional systems. A typical aerobic system consists of three components, a trash tank, a pump tank, and a treatment plant. Aerobic systems contain an aerator that circulates oxygen bubbles when the wastewater goes through the treatment plant. The oxygen provides a stable environment, helping the waste break down faster and more effectively than in conventional systems. The wastewater then travels through the pump tank to eliminate any pathogens, making it environmentally safe. Benefits of the uh, aerobic septic system, higher quality effluent. Aerobic systems generally produce cleaner effluent, therefore there is less chance of groundwater con contamination. Suitable for all types of land. One of the greatest benefits of an aerobic septic system is that they can be used in all types of land. Aerobic systems, septic systems, are designed to work well, regardless of the land type. Longevity, regular cleaning and inspection will keep your system functional for many years. Finally, e efficiency, aerobic bacteria typically break down household waste much faster than anaerobic bacteria that you would find in a septic tank, in the conventional septic system. Of course, like most things, there are some disadvantages to the aerobic system. Despite the substantial benefits, aerobic systems are generally limited use. Their main use is to replace failed septic systems. Here are a few of the substantial disadvantages. Number one is cost. Their initial cost is often several times that of a conventional septic system. Since these systems use electric pumps to circulate air through the sewage, the site must have electricity and the owner must bear the ongoing cost of electric usage. These are substantially more complicated systems than traditional gravity powered systems. 
And as such, their ongoing maintenance costs are much higher. Some of the more frequent questions asked regarding both convention and aerobic septic systems. Where should septic tanks be placed? Septic tanks should be placed away from areas subject to flooding and surface water ponding. The tank should be properly vented. The tank should also be placed where it is accessible for future inspections and pumpings. So who is responsible for maintaining the septic system? Routine maintenance is the responsibility of the property owner. How often should my septic tank be pumped? The average household septic system should be inspected at least every three years by a septic service professional. Household septic tanks are typically pumped every three to five years. Alternative systems with electrical float switches, pumps, or mechanical components should be inspected more often, generally once a year. A service contract is important since alternative systems have mechanized parts. How can I prevent a septic system failure? Inspect the system every one to three years, as we just mentioned. Pump the tank every three to five years. Flush only human waste and toilet paper. Some other questions directly related to uh, preventing a septic uh, system failure. Does using a garbage disposal unit impact my septic system? The answer is yes. Using an in-sink garbage disposal unit can impact how often you need to pump your septic tank. Food waste usually is slowly digested by the healthy bacteria in your septic tank and can accumulate as scum and sludge. If a large amount of water enters the septic tank or the tank fills up with solids, it can push the solids into the drain field, causing the pipes to clog and increasing the thickness of the biomat. If you must use a garbage disposal unit, your tank will need to be pumped more frequently. Well, should I be careful of what I pour down the drain? Yes, many materials that might be poured down the drain do not easily decompose. This can be harmful to the healthy bacteria that grow in your septic tank and drain field to help break down organic matter. Do not pour grease such as fats, butter, wax, cheese, or heavy cream. Liquid waste such as pesticides, drain cleaners, household chemicals, paints, and unnecessary amount of solid material into your tank. Harmful chemicals put down your drain can also be discharged into the groundwater and can impact drinking water supplies in the environment. Whether you flush it down the toilet, grind it in the garbage disposal, or pour it down the sink, shower, or bath, everything that goes down your drain ends up in your system. What goes down the drain affects how well your system works. Finally, use water efficiently. The average indoor water use in a typical single family home can be as much as 70 gallons per individual per day. 
Just a single leak or running toilet can add as much as 200 gallons of water per day. All the water a household sends down to the pipe ends up in its septic system. The more water a household conserves, the less water enters the septic system. Efficient water use improves the operation of a septic system and reduces the risk of malfunction. So now that we have discussed briefly the conventional septic system and the aerobic uh, septic unit or aerobic treatment unit, which we've classified as on-site wastewater um, treatment systems, we, we now can, can transfer the discussion into uh, lagoons. And many small rural and tribal communities across the United States rely on lagoon systems to treat their municipal wastewater. In the lagoon, wastewater is treated through a combination of physical, biological, and chemical processes. So what happens in the lagoon? Evaporation reduces the liquid volume of wastewater, returning water vapor to the environment. The solids settle to the bottom and form sludge. There is an aerobic zone at the top of the wastewater layer where air movement introduces oxygen and aerobic microorganisms convert waste to carbon dioxide, ammonia, and phosphate. So one thing to point out here is that just, just as the case is with the septic systems, you've got a similar type of bacteria, the aerobic, in this particular instance, aerobic bacteria in an aerobic zone that's utilizing the oxygen to uh, convert the waste. Algae in the lagoon use these as food source and give off oxygen. This is the process you may be familiar with called photosynthesis. There is also an anaerobic zone. A lagoon has an aerobic and anaerobic zone. The anaerobic zone, as you might recall, uh, is in the absence of oxygen. And it's located near the bottom of the wastewater layer where ana anaerobic microorganisms break down waste produce break down the waste producing hydrogen sulfide ammonia and methane gas now there are three types of lagoons that that we're going to mention the first is the anaerobic lagoon we're only going to mention it uh, briefly just to identify that it does exist these type of lagoons are typically used in agriculture and industrial applications. Uh, because this discussion is focused primarily on domestic wastewater, we're not gonna spend any time addressing uh, the anaerobic lagoon because it's more of an agricultural and industrial application. A facultative lagoon. Facultative lagoons may be actively aerated or simply have oxygen diffusing from the air into the surface water. Ideally, there are both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria present, active and contributing to the removal of the contaminants. Often, an anaerobic bottom water layer and sediment provide the anaerobic environment for the same processes as the anaerobic lagoon, but aerobic bacteria present in upper water layers can perform additional metabolic processes, processes such as nitrification. So as you see from, from the diagram that the facultative lagoon has both uh, an anaerobic zone and an aerobic zone, and the anaerobic zone being on the bottom with functions similar to that of an anaerobic lagoon or even similar to that of the conventional septic tank 
Uh, however, as as you as the as you approach the surface, you start uh, picking up aerobic bacteria from the sunlight and algae through the process of photosynthesis. Facultative lagoons. The concept is, is well suited for rural communities and in some industries where land, land costs are not a limiting factor. Facultative lagoons can be used to treat raw, screened, or primary settled municipal water and biodegradable industrial wastewaters. Some of the advantages of a facultative lagoon they're moderately effective in removing settleable solids, BOD, pathogens, fecal coliform, and ammonia. They're relatively easy to operate, require little energy with systems designed to operate with gravity flow. Some of the disadvantages of a facultative lagoon include settled sludges and inert material require periodic removal difficult to control or predict ammonia levels in the effluent. Sludge accumulations will be higher in cold climates due to reduced microbial activity. And lagoons require relatively large areas of land. Facultative lagoons require relatively large areas of land. Methods of aerating lagoons. Lagoons are frequently aerated with surface aerators that mix a zone around the aerator as well as increase the dissolved oxygen. Such lagoons are rarely completely mixed or maintain significant dissolved oxygen in 100% of the water volume. So there are anaerobic processes occurring in the sediment on the bottom and in dead zones, not thoroughly mixed or aerated. Aerators are typically motor driven. They can be submerged or floating jet aerators or surface aerators, uh, fixed in place aerators or injection of compressed air through submerged diffusers. An aerated lagoon is well suited for municipal wastewaters of low to medium strength. While such systems are somewhat land intensive, they require much less area than a facultative lagoon and can provide a better level of treatment. Operation and maintenance requirements are also less than those required for activated sludge and similar technologies. A physical modification to an aerated lagoon uses plastic curtains supported by floats and anchors to the bottom to divide existing lagoons into multiple sails and or serve as baffles to improve hydraulic conditions. A recently developed approach suspends a row of submerged diffusers from flexible floating booms which move in a cyclic pattern during aeration activity. This serves to treat a larger volume with each aeration line. Effluent is periodically recycled within the system to improve performance. If there is sufficient depth for effective oxygen transfer, aeration is used to upgrade existing facultative ponds and is sometimes used on a seasonal basis during periods of peak wastewater discharge to the lagoon. Some of the advantages of the aerated lagoon requires less land than the facultative lagoon, depending on the design conditions. An aerated lagoon can usually discharge throughout the winter, while discharge may be prohibited from an ice-covered facultative lagoon in the same climate. Sludge disposal may be necessary, but the quantity will be relatively small compared to other secondary treatment processes. Aerated lagoons are not as effective as facultative disadvantage. The disadvantage of an aerated lagoon is they're typically not as effective as facultative ponds 
in removing ammonium nitrogen or phosphorus unless designed for nitrification. Aerated lagoons may, expense, may experience surface ice formation, reduced rates of biological activity during cold weather. Sludge accumulation rates will be higher in cold climates because low temperature inhibits anaerobic reactions. So uh, after, after having discussed the conventional septic system and the aerobic septic treatment unit, and we briefly talked about a facultative lagoon and the aerated lagoon, you know, these conversations all lead to uh, the next phase of treatment, which in this instance is disinfection. The impact of untreated domestic wastewater has raised several health and safety concerns. Disinfection has become one of the primary mechanisms for the inactivation destruction of pathogenic organisms. We identify E. coli earlier in the discussion as uh, among these pathogenic microorganisms. One method that's used to treat wastewater is chlorination, which is reliable and effective against a wide spectrum of pathogenic organisms. The use of chlorine gas in wastewater treatment is a tried and true methodology that has existed for many, many years. Chlorination has flexible dosing control and produces a residual that remains in the wastewater effluent even after initial treatment and can be measured to evaluate the effectiveness. Chlorine can eliminate certain noxious odors during disinfection, such as hydrogen sulfide gas, which produces the well-familiar rotten egg odor often associated with wastewater. Chlorine disinfection is reliable and effective against a wide spectrum of pathogenic organisms. Some of the disadvantages of chlorination, chlorine is toxic to aquatic life even at low concentrations. In such instance, if you provide disinfection using chlorine, you may also be required to dechlorinate. Dechlorination is the process of removing any residual chlorine after the water has been adequately disinfected. All forms of chlorine are highly corrosive and toxic. The storage, shipping, and handling pose a risk requiring increased safety regulations. Now, there are many mathematical calculations that are useful in evaluating the adequacy of wastewater treatment. Of course, time will not allow us to delve into this topic in great detail. However, here are two examples. The first, we have identified chlorine as a necessary component in the disinfection process. We have also identified it as being highly toxic to aquatic life and that dechlorination may be necessary. Here is a quick way to calculate the loading in pounds per day on the receiving stream in this particular example. If a treatment plant discharges 150,000 gallons per day with a chlorine residual of 0 0.1 milligrams per liter, how many pounds per day of chlorine will the receiving waters receive? 
So the question is, how many pounds per day of chlorine will the receiving waters receive? Our formula for pounds per day indicates that pounds per day equals parts per million times the flow in million gallons per day times 8.34. Our milligram per liter, or in this instance, parts per million concentration is 0 0.1 milligrams per liter. Our flow is 150,000 gallons per day. Converted to million gallons to, per day is 0 0.150 million gallons per day. Multiplied by our constant of 8.34 gives us a pounds per day total of 0 0.1251. Now, of course, that, that wasn't rocket science, but it is a relatively simple equation that you can perform in order to, to get a grasp on how many pounds per day of chlorine that you may be feeding the receiving stream, particularly if you're not dechlorinating. Keeping in mind of the toxicity of chlorine and the impact, the negative impact that it could have on aquatic life. The second equation, this one involves a septic tank. How do I calculate the size of a septic tank? Of course, the size of the septic tank uh, goes a long way towards telling you a lot of valuable information, such as how often it should be pumped. So here's a relatively simple equation that, that you can use or the, the, the plumbing professionals will also utilize in determining the, the size of a septic tank. What is the approximate value, volume, of a rectangular tank with the following measurements? 72 inches wide, 96 inches long, and 84 inches deep. Well, the very first thing we're gonna do is gonna convert, convert the measurements that are currently in inches to feet. And we're gonna do that by dividing by 12. So 72 inches equals six feet. 96 inches equals eight feet. 84 inches divided by 12 equals seven feet. Our volume formula says volume equals length in feet times width in feet times the height or the depth in feet. In this instance, volume equals eight feet by six feet by seven feet, giving us a volume of 336 cubic feet. Now, 336 cubic feet is, is a suitable answer, but typically we refer to volume in gallons. So in order to convert our cubic feet into gallons, we will say 336 cubic feet multiplied by 7.5 equals 2,520 gallons. So just a pretty simple, um, quick uh, calculation that, that you could use in determining some valuable information as it relates to uh, septic tank or your pump tank or, or any tank, you know, in the treatment process that you may have at your facility. I am, um, that, that concludes this presentation. I want to thank you for your uh, attendance and for allowing me the opportunity to present this information. Uh, it is my hope that the information that was prevented uh, that you will find useful in, in whatever uh, your endeavors are, your field of, of work. And at this time, uh, Christy, if you're there, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, KT. 
So I'm going to open up a couple of minutes for people to get in any questions that they'd like to ask KT while we have them. Um, so go ahead and get your questions into the question box and I will start asking. All right, KT. So Michael wants to know a little bit more about drain fields. Okay. Well, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. For some reason. Okay, a, a septic. A septic drain field, uh, also also referred to as a leach field, are are subsurface, you know, series of uh, piping used to remove com contaminants and impurities from 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 the tank. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I don't know if, if if he could get a little more specific about his question, but but the drain field is is what carries the water from the tank to to the soil and, and typically they 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 will be perforated and as it travels through the drain fields it will percolate throughout throughout the soil over the course of the, the drain travels. It's a series of perforated pipes uh, which the liquid from the septic tank uh, perforates through into the soil. All right, KT. So it looks like he said that he's wondering how to maintain a drain field. How to maintain a drain field? Well, the the the, the real question in maintaining a drain field is the permeability of the soil. That's one thing to take into consideration. The, the other thing to consider is the effectiveness of the septic tank or the aeration treatment unit because solids sol if solids leave the septic tank they could plug the drain field and not not allow it to to, to percolate through the soil so i i, I want to answer this question by stating that uh, the the drain fields are more or less how effective they are is more or less a product of if any solids are leaving the the tank and if the soil that the water is percolating if it's unsaturated thank you kt all right so the next question is with a 20 a uh, 2,500 gallon septic tank and a house with four people that use average 50 gallons per day per person, how quickly does the sludge accumulate in depth to justify only pumping it out every three years? Okay, is that, that that's a question that's gonna require some calculation, which, yeah. I'll, which I'll be happy to answer. But I may not be able to do it in the time frame that we've got. Is, yeah. Is, is there a way that you yeah, could get that yeah, question absolutely. to me and I could respond yeah. back to that individual? Absolutely. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is copy this question and then I'm going to um, email you, KT, and then I'll right. CC this person who had asked. And Perfect. I'm going to move on to the next question then. Okay. Um, After going through an aerated lagoon and chlorination system, how long should wastewater sit in a holding pond before it is dispersed via sprinklers to the surrounding land? So it, it goes through an aerated pond first? It says after going through an aerated lagoon and chlorination system. How long should wastewater sit in a holding pond before it is dispersed via sprinklers to the land? Well, I don't know that that there's a specific answer to that question. I, I will say this, that 
so it goes through an aerated lagoon and it's repeat that question one more time after going through an aerated lagoon and chlorination system how long should wastewater sit in a holding pond before it is dispersed via sprinklers to the surrounding land i got you okay well i don't know that there is a definite answer for that because it's going to depend on the effectiveness of the chlorination assuming because you want to make sure that after chlorination that you've got enough contact time to kill the pathogens before before releasing it so that's more more likely a question that would be answered through some on-site testing for example if the individual had the ability to collect a sample of, of the fecal to determine if if all of the fecal was being killed of course also keep in mind that after you kill the fecal the longer it it sets you know you stand the chance of it coming back as well so uh, you know it's 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 more or less a trial and error based on the the specific application but i would certainly utilize some on-site testing to determine whether or not it's being adequately chlorinated and then uh, at what point and how long before that 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 fecal or e coli bacteria starts to reaccumulate thank you kt he says thank you as well and um last question is the lagoon system a new method of wastewater treatment or can it come after aerobic treatments? Is the lagoon a new system? Does is the lagoon system, is it the new method of wastewater treatment or can it come after aerobic treatment? A lagoon system can in fact come after uh, what, aerobic or anaerobic? Aerobic aerobic i got you okay yeah so typically typically after you would you would not an aerobic system and i'm assuming i'm wondering if he's referring to it and he's referring to an aerobic treatment system like a septic tank i'm not sure that was just the question i'll see if maybe he'll follow up with more information yeah, let's, follow, let's let's follow up because i've, I've I've actually got a few more questions for that question. Yeah. All right, we'll give everyone another minute. We'll see if he wants to follow up. Until then, I'd like to thank you, KT, for sharing your expertise with us today. Following this webinar, everyone will receive a follow-up email with the slides from today and a link to the recording. We also ask that you complete the webinar evaluation following this webinar so you can let us know your thoughts on today's session as this helps us plan future webinars on topics that are important to you. All right, great course, people say. Useful information, very clear presentation. All right, KT, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to follow up with you with that email. If you would get those questions to me, I'd love to answer them. I just don't think we've got time right now. Absolutely. I will get those over to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a great day. We hope to see you at future EFCN events. Thanks.